All right. I'm to do myself. There we go. We're recording everybody. So you have the option if you want to leave your image up uh, on the screen or if you want to just turn off your camera, that's fine okay. too. I mean, I'd probably leave it too, just in case anybody has any questions. And I right. have some things as we're going through some of the slides. Um, I brought toys to show everybody. Um, and then kind of demonstrations, similar to what I did with COPD. Asthma and COPD tend to overlap in some areas. Um, and it's always good to reiterate, you know, inhaler technique and some of the things that do overlap because the more you learn it, the more you talk about it, the more you're going to be able to take care of it on your own. So great. I, I can do it. Sure. In my <laughs> <laughs> well, great. Well, I just want to welcome you this morning, um, Allison. I really appreciate your coming back to do another program on, um, on breathing and the respiratory system. Today's is um, Better Breathing with Asthma. Um, Allison is a, she's a respiratory therapist with Tallahassee Memorial Hospital. And again, I just welcome everybody and I thank you. And I would say, uh, Allison, do you want to be interrupted with questions or do you want people to hold their questions or chat their questions? I do have a slide at the end for questions, but I mean, okay. I'm open for anybody to kind of interject and ask if you'd like to. Um, asthma is, even though it overlaps with COPD, it's so much more complex. Um, it has a lot of different moving parts and stuff. I mean, I've been a therapist for seven and a half years and there are times where asthma still even confuses me. And so feel free to, to jump in and ask questions. If I don't know, I'll, I'll let you know. And if not, I'll figure out, I found a way to find out for you too. Great. Um, so thanks again, everybody, for having me. I'm, I'm really happy that I'm able to come back and do another presentation for you. Um, during the last time, right before the meeting um, about COPD, you know, I could go on for days about different things that affect your breathing. Um, some of the bigger ones that really do affect your breathing as you get older and in your life, the more common diseases is COPD and asthma. So we'll just get right into it. Um, for, let me see. Oh. My screen's not wanting to go. There we go, I got it. Um, <laughs> so once again, this is the same quote I kind of opened with last time. Um, as a respiratory therapist, I take breathing very, very seriously, um, especially now in this climate with what the past year that we've gone through, um, the ability to breathe is a gift. So you wanna wake up each day grateful for that gift. It's something that we tend to take for granted for until you can't do it. You don't really think about how important your breathing is until you're, it's affected. Um, once again, for those of you who don't know me, I'm a Tallahassee local and I've been a therapist for about seven and a half years. Um, I actually do have a lot of good certifications, uh, basic life support, advanced life support, pediatric life support, and neonatal life support certified. Um, I worked at UF Health Shands for three years and I worked specifically in critical care, still not seminal though, I had to make sure everybody knew that. Um, I've been at TMH for about three years and I was promoted to the chronic lung disease navigator um, back in 2019. So once again, to refresh everybody's memory, a respiratory therapist, a lot of times we get confused as a nurse, um, which I don't mind. It doesn't, it, I'm, I'm basically a respiratory nurse, um, but we are, you know, specialized healthcare practitioners and we're trained specifically in pulmonary medicine and pulmonary mechanics. Um, in order to work therapeutically with people suffering from pulmonary diseases. Um, it's a minimum associate's degree and we are board certified from the National Board of Respiratory Care. We are licensed healthcare practitioners. I had to take two separate board exams to get my license. Um, you will find this pretty much everywhere. You know, respiratory therapists are located in hospitals and ICUs, pediatric and neonatal ICUs. We work in the emergency room. Um, we work in long-term acute care, um, rehabilitation centers, skilled nursing facilities. Um, a lot of times we're the people that are hooking you up in the sleep disorder clinics when we're doing the sleep studies, um, home health care, and then pulmonary function labs. Um, our, even though we're so concentrated on the lungs, we do a whole lot. We, we deliver oxygen via many oxygen delivery devices. We do medications, which we will get into later. Um, we do chest physiotherapy and lung expansion exercises when you've been in the hospital for a long time. Um, we monitor and titrate the ventilators and ventilated patients. All the machines that you think possible that can help you breathe, we are basically in charge of. We also transport critical patients on those machines. So we're in, in charge of monitoring those machines and the patients during transports. Um, we actually do place um, 
arterial bloodlines and take samples. And then we do diagnostic testing, which is the polysomnography is the sleep study, um, pulmonary function testing, pink flow measurements, which we will speak about later, um, and do bedside lung mechanic measurements too. So we actually do quite a lot. Um, so what is asthma? Asthma is defined as a respiratory condition marked by spasms in the bronchi of the lungs causing difficulty breathing. It usually results from allergic reaction or other forms of hypersensitivity. And when I talk about hypersensitivity, I'm saying that your lungs become more constricted more easily than other, uh, a normal person's lungs. And, you know, when we talk about spasms, that has to do with the muscle within your lung tissue. Um, it is considered a long-term obstructive lung disease. And it can cause episodes of coughing, wheezing, and shortness of breath. Um, asthma is a condition that cannot be cured, but it's manageable with the correct medication, phys physician, and education. So here are some fun statistics from you guys, or for you guys. Um, approximately 25 million Americans have asthma, and this equals to about one in 13 Americans. So it's actually a pretty common um, respiratory illness. It's one of the most common respiratory illnesses that you can get. 8% um, of adults and 7% are children. About 20 million US adults age 18 and over have asthma. And asthma is more common in adult women than adult men. Um, it's a leading chronic disease in children. It's when we talk about pediatric ICU, um, basically in pediatric patients, the most common pediatric patient I see other than the RSV season that we get is asthmatics. Um, currently, uh, there are about 5.1 million children under the age, age of 18 with asthma. Um, and asthma is more common in boys than girls. So signs and symptoms of asthma. Um, coughing. And coughing from asthma, asthma is much often worse at night and, and early morning, and it can be dry or mucus filled. Uh, wheezing. And wheezing is like that whistling or squeezy sound, especially when you breathe out. We consider asthma an obstructive disease. So sometimes whenever you are having a hard time, you're having a flare up from your asthma, you can get the breath in, but you have a really hard time getting it out. And because of that obstruction where your airways are starting to close up a little bit. And so what that does is it creates a sound called wheezing. It's that whistling through those very narrow airways. Um, sometimes you can really hear it from like, yeah, I can walk into a room and hear it all the way at the other end. And sometimes it can be really, really quiet and you can only hear it with that stethoscope. Um, chest tightness is kind of tightness where it feels like somebody's squeezing your chest or like I've, I've heard patients say I have an elephant sitting on my chest. Um, and then shortness of breath, which is basically feeling breathless and inability to take a deep breath or usually it's just exhale um, completely. So physiological symptoms, this is where I'm starting to get into pictures because it kind of pictures are worth a thousand words. So basically on the left side, you have those healthy lungs, your smooth muscle is relaxed, it is open, air can get in and out. What ends up happening whenever your asthma is triggered is those smooth muscles start to tighten and that airway starts to become a little bit narrowed. And also when those smooth muscles start to tighten, they start to secrete excess mucus. So on top of the swelling that you have and the inability to get the air through the narrowed airways, that mucus, and it only takes a small amount, can actually cause what we call mucus plugging and it can make those airways even more narrow. And a lot of times it feels like you have something stuck in your chest and you can't quite cough it up and out. So muscles, yeah, I just explained all that, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Um, so what causes asthma? Um, a lot of time, probably the number one cause is a family history. Um, and then uh, other things that can cause it is your mother's smoking or exposure to secondhand smoke um, or air pollution during pregnancy, uh, early childhood exposure, such as secondhand smoke pollution or indoor allergies, uh, damage to developing lungs due to premature birth or early childhood respiratory illnesses. And adults, it's usually exposure to chemical irritants or in industrial dusts in the workplace. Um, so this is kind of where things get a little tricky. And I, I'm, I mentioned this a lot is there are so many different types of asthma. And as I was saying earlier, this is where it gets a little confusing because there are so many different types of asthma that even whenever it comes to healthcare practitioners taking care of it, it's really hard to pinpoint exactly what type it is. Um, the two most common are the allergic asthma and the non-allergic asthma, which we call extrinsic and intrinsic. Um, we also have adult onset asthma, seasonal asthma, um, asthma COPD overlap, exercise-induced asthma, occupational asthma, and nocturnal asthma. 
So the two most in common ones that I was talking about is that, you know, um, allergic and non-allergic. And so when we talk about the allergic, the intrinsic asthma, um, that is usually caused by um, a type one hypersensitivity. So when you see that IgE, that has to do with, you know, allergens and stuff within your blood. Um, it usually begins in childhood. It's usually a family history or um, associated allergies. And the most common cause is environmental and what, not necessarily what causes it, but what triggers you is environmental antigens. So dust, pollen, food. Um, intrinsic asthma is non-immune mechanisms. It usually is an adult onset asthma. There's no family history. And most common causes, you know, are res respiratory tract infections. So triggers, the big kind of, you know, word of the day for asthma is triggers. Um, there are a bunch of different things when you're talking about exercise induced, um, uh, occupational asthma, you know, allergic versus non allergic. These are the things that trigger your asthma. So, you know, the indoor allergens is mold and pet dander, dust mites, cockroaches. Your outdoor allergens are pollen, mold, smoke from fires. Um, you can have irritants, a secondhand smoke, diesel exhaust, air pollution, um, respiratory viruses, a cold, a flu, a sinus infection. A lot of times exercise, my brother has exercise induced asthma. So whenever you get overheated, it can cause, a, it can trigger a, a, a flare up. Um, cold air or sudden change in temperature, which here in Florida, especially in Tallahassee, especially with the way the weather's been right now, you go outside, it's like 100% humidity, and then you walk into a cold building. Um, that can trigger somebody's asthma. Uh, strong smells such as perfumes uh, can really trigger your asthma. And then strong emotions, even if you're really, really happy and something super funny, it can trigger a flare up. Um, if you're really upset, it can trigger a flare up. If you're really angry, it can trigger a flare up. And then we also have hormonal changes too. And like I said, this is where it gets tricky. So asthma is more of a syndrome rather than a single disease. So you want to take into effect your triggers. Um, it's kind of the same mechanism, no matter what causes it, the chain of events that happens afterwards is usually pretty common and pretty the same with everybody. You have your trigger, whether or not it's going to be, you know, your exercise, if it's an allergen, if it's not allergic, if you're angry and you got mad at somebody, no matter what, the trigger is always going to cause an airway inflammation. It's going to have that secretion of mucus. It's going to have that airway muscle constriction and the swelling of those bronchial membranes, you know, your airway um, and breathing passages become narrow. And then you have the wheezing and the coughing and the shortness of breath. So how is asthma diagnosed? Um, I added a little quote at the top because, you know, all that wheezes or coughs might not necessarily be asthma. You should always talk to a physician if you suspect you may have asthma. Um, talking about that wheezing earlier, you know, usually the number one cause of wheezing is either asthma or some kind of obstructive lung disease, but there are other things that can cause you to have some of those symptoms as well. Um, so that's why it's always really important to consult, consult with your physician or even a specialist. Um, asthma is a lot more involved whenever it comes to diagnosing exactly what type of asthma and what your triggers are. Um, it's something that you really have to pay very close attention to. Um, a deep dive into symptoms, you know, patient history and diagnostic testing can help diagnose asthma and they might order a number of tests. Um, during our COPD, um, talk, we talked about spirometry and pulmonary function testing. Um, we definitely will, will use that in asthma. We will do allergy testing, um, chest x-ray, and even an electrocardiogram, a fractional inhaled nitric oxide test, and exercise testing. Um, it can be a lot more complex, so and it, it's something that you really have to stay on top of, and it can evolve as well. Um, so it can be a lot more tiring than any other testing. So basically, how do I manage my asthma? So like I said, asthma is very involved. So you have to basically be on top of what's going on with your breathing. Uh, management of asthma requires diligence in recognizing, treating, and preventing your symptoms. So the first thing a physician may do is if they do kind of go through some of those diagnostic testing and they say, hey, we suspect asthma, um, the most common thing is to actually keep an asthma diary or journal to self-monitor your symptoms and recognize your triggers. And that's the way that you kind of get to know your asthma. Um, 
sometimes, and you can find a lot of these diaries, you can make one yourself, but a lot of times it's like on Monday in the morning, I woke up and I was short of breath. Um, I did my peak flow meter and this is what my measurement was. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, I've used my medication today. This is, I was around this whenever I started feeling short of breath. Um, and that's something that you're constantly going to have to monitor because the more you monitor it, the more you have, um, like a good little diary and you know exactly and then you start to really get to know this is the time of day and you can kind of get on top of your symptoms before it starts getting a problem um so peak flow measurements that's what i was talking about just a second ago and a one way to monitor your asthma is you use a peak flow meter which is this little bad boy right here and it's a picture of it right there so peak flow meters are handheld devices used to measure the maximum speed that you can force air out of your lungs. We call it a PFER or a peak expiratory flow rate. The use of peak flow meters allow you to recognize the difference between a normal baseline um, and increasing airway obstruction. So the order, only way to really get to know your asthma and know your peak flow measurements is you have to measure it whenever you're feeling good and when you're feeling bad and when you're feeling really bad. Um, if you have a consistent um, if you've used this for like three weeks in a row, then you should have a consistent baseline. When you have a consistent baseline, um, there's actually a nice little brochure that comes with all peak flow meters right here. When you have a consistent baseline um, and you know about where you normally are, it'll give you a range of basically green, yellow, and red. So green is good and that's gonna be your normal baseline that you've measured for a couple of weeks. Um, yellow is gonna say, hey, I'm not doing too good. You might need to take some more medications. You might need to pay attention to it. And then red will be, you need to go to the hospital. You need to go to the physician. You need to get somebody to help you. Um, the way that it works is these little, I don't know if you guys can see it cause it's really bright, but the red, yellow, and green. So for example, and then we have this little red thing right here on the side and that floats up. You always wanna start with it at the bottom. And the way that a peak flow measurement works is you're gonna take a big deep breath and blow out as forcefully, as hard and as fast as you can. So, so see, I got mine up to about 300. I didn't give it my best shot, but a lot of times if I can do this once or twice a day for a week, I'll have basically where my numbers normally are. If I start using that and it starts getting in the yellow, that's whenever I know I need to start paying a little bit closer attention, something's happening. Um, asthma attacks can come on very, very quickly. So it's very important to recognize your symptoms and constantly monitor your disease. Um, a lot of, we're kind of getting to the point where the COPD and asthma, asthma overlap just a little bit. Um, some of the same medications we use for COPD, we use with asthma. So we have our inhaled medications, bronchodilators, uh, bronchodilators with asthma are your best friend, especially your rescue medications such as albuterol, and those basically help relax that smooth muscle that gets really tight when you have a flare-up with your asthma. We have two different types of bronchodilators. We have the short-acting, which is our albuterol. It's a rescue medication. It works really, really quickly, but it just doesn't last very long. Then we also have our long acting bronchodilators. We call those our maintenance medications. And those work over a longer period of time to prevent the flare ups and prevent that inflammation from happening. Um, another Excuse type of me. That lets Sorry? Excuse me, Allison. I have a question. Sure. Is the rescue in uh, when I? because I'm drinking liquid and I choke mm -hmm. my it seems like my throat closes up and I cannot take in any air would the rescue inhaler help me um it might do you have any uh issues with swallowing any what we call dysphagia um problems yes. swallowing ever have they ever have you ever seen yes. this have you ever seen a speech therapist about um, proper ways to swallow, maybe to prevent that from happening? No. So whenever- I had, I, I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, you're okay. I, I had uh, some sort of x-ray test and the technician told me that when I drink, 
I should be looking down and using a straw. Okay, so the chin to chest technique, it sounds like you had what's called a swallow study where they basically yes. have you swallow liquid and they watch it go down under um, an x-ray. And then when they yes. tell you to swallow it's chin to chest and then swallow up like that. Were you able to watch me do that just now? Yes. So remember in the in the previous slides, you could possibly use a inhaler and it might help a little bit, especially if some of that liquid gets down into your lungs because with we call that dysphagia and whenever liquid does get into your lungs absolutely that can cause a flare-up because it's an automatic inflammation you know liquids going down to where it's not supposed to so it can cause some inflammation so absolutely you can use your rescue inhaler i would say definitely work with um if you're able to it might help you to see a speech therapist and do some or even just do some research, you can ask your primary care about it. And they can teach you some swallowing exercises that will also help prevent that liquid from getting into your airway. Because I would say, okay, looking at it from um, a point of view is the liquid, the liquid going into your airway is what we would call a trigger. Absolutely, you want to treat it with a short acting or that rescue inhaler if you go into a coughing fit and everything clamps up on you. But you also want to be proactive right. and go see your physician or talk to them about ways to prevent that from happening in the first place. Okay, thank okay. you. Of course. Um, back on our medications. Um, another really, really popular drug that we use specifically for asthma, um, we do use it for COPD as well, but it's actually the standard for um, asthma is our inhaled corticosteroids. Um, those are med medications that help suppress inflammation, and they are the first-line therapy for all patients with persistent asthma, and it helps control symptoms and prevent the flare-ups or exacerbations. Um, they are also considered the long-acting or maintenance drugs. They work over a long period of time to prevent the flare-ups. I wouldn't necessarily use them whenever you have something happening, like whenever that fluid goes down into your, your lungs and you're having a problem. That is for the rescue medications, but the if you have especially um, a more hypersensitive airway and the rescue medications don't work over, you use them over and over again, the like steroids can help a little bit too. Um, this is one of my favorite charts because um, it's so, so detailed. It comes from the allergy um, and asthma network. This is kind of a snapshot of the types of inhalers that we use in treatments for COPD and asthma. Um, and we have those short acting and the long acting bronchodilators. We have the inhaled corticosteroids. And then sometimes you'll have other inhalers that combine some of those medications. So you don't have to use like three different inhalers. You can use one as your maintenance medication. Um, down at the bottom, we have something called biologics and bronchial thermoplasty, which we'll talk about later. And those are other types of things that we can do to treat asthma. Um, that just don't necessarily include inhaled medications. Um, once again, we talked about some of these whenever uh, we were doing the COPD, we have types of inhaled medication devices. Uh, my personal favorite that we use in the hospital is the nebulizer. It's a device for breathing treatments. It helps you breathe better. It changes your liquid medication into a very fine mist and the mist goes into your airways whenever you breathe in. Um, Nebulizers are fantastic because they use they are used over a period of time. So um, the particle size is pretty small. A lot of people really love the nebulizers. We also have something called a meter dose inhaler, which is um, it has a measured amount of medication, um, and it's delivered by an inhaled an internal propellant. So it's basically that second one right here. Um, we call it a boot as well because it looks like a boot. Um, we also have dry powder inhalers and they deliver medication as a dry powder that you have to take a big deep breath to breathe in. And then last but not least, we have a Respermat, which is a soft mist inhaler. Um, Respermat is fairly new, but um, we love them in the respiratory world. They can be quite expensive um, depending on your insurance, but they um, offer a fine mist as well. So when we talk about the proper use of inhaled medications, um, we there are certain ways to use your inhalers to get the best bang for your buck. 
Um, I will bring out my handy dandy um, arrow chamber again. Um, these things are wonderful, especially if you have a hard time, if you have arthritis and you have a hard time squeezing your inhaler when it's in your mouth. Um, if you think you have a hard time, you know, just even coordinating the timing of taking your big deep breath in, I always encourage the use of one of these. You can actually get about 30% more of your medication if you use one of these. So me, myself, I feel like I feel like I would have a good time squeezing this down and taking a big deep breath in. But also one, one thing about the MDIs is that it has that internal propellant. So even if I think I squeeze and take a big deep breath and I coordinated everything perfectly, a lot of this medication because of that propellant is gonna end up in my mouth and not down into my lungs where it needs to be. So the reason why this is so fantastic is I can take this right here and stick it right there on the end and it's not gonna go anywhere. And I have a little mouthpiece right here. So at the end of this chamber right here, there's a little valve. So once I squeeze the medicine in here, it's not going anywhere until I put it in my mouth and I take a big deep breath in. So whenever I wanna do an inhaler, whether it be my albuterol, which is my rescue me medicine, or if I want to use my maintenance medicine, any type of inhaler that looks like this, which is that MDI, that metered dose inhaler, can be used with an aero chamber. So the way that it works is I'm getting ready to take my, my inhaler. I'm gonna sit on the edge of my bed. I always wanna do my inhaler sitting straight up, not standing. Um, I'll shake up my inhaler like I need to and get it ready. And then what I will do is I will actually squeeze my medicine and let it shoot out into my chamber. And then I will put it in my mouth and take a big deep breath in. After you take that big deep breath in, you're gonna to wanna to hold your breath for about 15 seconds or as long as you can. When you hold your breath, you're allowing that medicine to disperse into your upper airways and settle down to where it needs to be. Um, I always say most of the time when you use these, the dosage is two puffs. You always wanna wait about 30 to 45 seconds between your puffs. Um, Cause you wanna allow that first, that first um, puff to get in there before you start your second one. You also want to make sure that when you are taking that big deep breath on your aero chamber is that you are taking a nice controlled deep breath in. You don't want to do it super hard and super fast because that creates what we call turbulent flow. Um, a lot of these things actually have a whistle. So if I suck too hard on it, it actually will tell me I'm breathing in too hard. You want to have a nice controlled kind of not as hard as you can, that way that medicine gets down to where it needs to go. Um, the picture right there on the screen are different types of aero chambers. We actually use aero chambers with children with asthma, especially like maybe our three-year-olds that have a, an inhaler, an albuterol inhaler at home. They are not going to cooperate to do this or this. So we actually end up using the aero chambers with those little masks on top of it. So a lot of times that's how parents are able to get their inhalers to their children is they squeeze it in here and then they hold the mask over their children's face for a little bit and it allows them to get that medicine down to where it needs to go. Um, another, when we talk about the dry powder inhalers, something like an Elipta, which is, um, we have Brio and a Noro. These are quite popular right now. Sometimes the um, one of the, common ones that we prescribe for asthma, is something called Brio. And that's a combination of a long acting bronchodilator and an inhaled corticosteroid. With the elliptas, the elliptas are powder inhalers. So you do need to be able to do that huge, big, deep breath in to get the medicine where it needs to go. So whenever you do your powder inhalers, once again, sitting down, sitting up straight. What I like to do is kind of similar to the swallowing. I like to kind of start down here and take a big deep breath in. So, so as hard and as fast as you can, and then you always still wanna make sure you're doing that breath hold afterwards for about 10 to 15 seconds because that allows the medication to settle down where it needs to go. Um, nebulizers are pretty kind of straightforward. Um, you'll have the little ampules of medication. I didn't steal one from work, so I, I apologize. I wanted to have one to put together for you guys. Um, basically, it's a little ampules of medication. You'll pour it into the cup and it attaches to a um, either an air processor or an oxygen. 
Anybody got a question? I heard. Yeah. Hey, hey, Allison. There's a couple. There's a couple questions. Um, I thought they could wait, but it's actually relevant to what you're talking about right now. Sure. Um, someone asked, "Where can I get an air chamber, and how do you clean it?" So you can actually get an air chamber from Amazon. I think they go on Amazon really? for like 15, 20 bucks. Um, and then some of them you just wash with warm soap and water. I guess I don't have my comments on right now because I have the the PowerPoint. So thanks for pointing that out. Um, the air chambers are usually you can get them on Amazon. You can always ask um, either your primary care or pulmonologist or a specialist. Sometimes they have they might even have them in the office and be like, here you go. Um, I know if you come to TMH and you have, if you have inhalers and you take them at TMH, uh, we will absolutely give you one or give you the option of using one. Um, and they work pretty well. Um, I would never stick this in a washing machine, but they do come apart pretty easily. Back of it comes off and the lid comes off right here. So these are easily rinsed with just warm soap and water and just let them air, air dry um, on like a, a clean uh, paper towel. I have to figure out how to put this thing back again enough. Um, they shouldn't be super duper expensive. If you go to your pulmonologist or them and they say, oh yeah, we can get you one for 40 or $50. Good old Amazon, I promise you, probably has them for like 15 or 20. Um, other medications that manage asthma are oral corticosteroids, so prednisone. Um, we have something called leukotriene modifiers, and these are more specific to um, immune responses and your allergic asthma. Um, they, they block the action of the leukotrienes, which are the chemicals involved in the immune responses that cause the inflammation and swelling. So uh, monoleucast or Singulair is one of the popular medications. And then the biologics, these are a fairly newer therapy. I think they've only been around for maybe less than 10 years. And um, they tar target specific cells and pathways that cause the allergic inflammation linked to asthma. Um, sometimes they're over-the-counter meds. Sometimes they are, I think, injections. Um, I'm not even as familiar with them because I always deal with the inhaled medication. So some of those are, you know, finding out about the biologics very recently in my career, I was like, that's really awesome. And I heard that they work really, really well. Um, your medication regimen should always be discussed with your physician and uh, each asthma patient is completely different. So what works for you doesn't necessarily work for somebody else. Um, asthma is very complicated. So um, it's always super duper important to know your medications and, and discuss it with your doctor. If you are having a hard time affording medications, inhalers specifically tend to be really, really expensive. Um, know your avenues to kind of get on those medications. If you get prescribed one inhaler and it's super expensive, more than likely there's like a generic or a different inhaler from a different drug manufacturer that might be covered or might be a little less expensive. Um, if you're ever researching inhalers, GoodRx is fantastic because it can give you coupons and it can check prescription prices for you before you even go. It, can, it looks at pharmacies and stuff for you. And then I always say consult the drug manufacturer. Um, AstraZeneca is a wonderful drug company. They have something called AZ and Me. And if you don't have insurance or you're having a hard time qualifying, if you submit some of your financial information, sometimes they can help you and provide inhalers for up to a year. I know GSK um, is another drug manufacturer. They're the ones that make the Ellipta inhalers and um, Advair. They have a prescription assistance program too that is wonderful. So it's always good to do your research whenever it comes to inhaled medications because they can get really expensive. I know it's, I know it's a lot of like a shell shock to go to a pharmacy to pick up your inhaler and they're telling you that you have to pay 250 out of pocket for it. So I always say just try to do your research and try and you just got to ask a lot of questions. Um, other asthma treatments that I was talking about earlier is that bronchial thermoplasty. Um, it involves inserting a long, slender, flexible tube called a bronchoscope into the lungs and surrounding airways. And what it does is it heats and shrinks bronchial muscle tissue. So if you are just super inflamed, medication has not been working for you. This is one of the more really, really, really invasive therapies that they use for really extreme cases. 
Um, and then we also have allergy testing and immunotherapy. So it, you know, it's that blood and skin test to pinpoint your specific allergies. Um, like I said earlier, if you can pinpoint your triggers and especially with your allergic asthma, if I'm allergic to dust or dander, if I'm allergic to a specific like laundry detergent, um, immunotherapy can, you know, I'm going to introduce controlled amounts of that allergen to the immune system on a regular schedule, which will increase your tolerance. So action plan, and this is kind of similar to the COPD as well. The action plan will go along with your asthma um, diary or journal. Um, and it's something that you'll put together with your physician. It's basically, it's gonna have your important information. It's gonna have, you know, your name, your doctor's name and phone number, an emergency contact. Um, and then your triggers, you can check this off and you can also keep a copy of this and carry it around with you. So if you do have a flare up in public, you can kind of pull that out and say, this is my doctor, this is who I need to go, this is what's triggering me right now. Um, and then, like I said, with the zones, this is also the reason why it's so important to have that peak flow meter, which you can also get on Amazon as well, um, if, 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 if you ever want to start keeping like an asthma journal. Um, and your green zone is, like I said, that baseline where you're living your best life, you're having good, you're breathing's good, you're taking your medicines like you're supposed to, and you're doing your activities and you can sleep. But the yellow zone is whenever you start using that peak flow meter and it starts hitting in the yellow zone and you start having some symptoms of uh, whenever I get up, I'm feeling a little bit more short of breath. You know, I'm using my rescue inhaler more, more frequently. I'm feeling some coffee and I feel like I have a chest cold maybe coming on, uh, having a hard time doing things that I normally do. Um, and you're not being able to sleep very well. So that's kind of your yellow zone. That's kind of like a little bit of a warning, like, hey, something's going on. And when that happens too, you want to kind of get in touch with your pulmonologist or your primary care and say, hey, I've been hanging out in my yellow zone. I don't feel good. I've been using my rescue inhaler. And a lot of times they can try and get ahead of it and say, all right, come in, let's take a look and see what's happening. If you don't normally take oral steroids, maybe they'll start you on some steroids. What if you have a chest cold that's an infection that could lead to a, a bigger attack? They might be able to get ahead of it so you don't end up in the red zone. And the red zone is what we call the danger zone. Um, it is severe breathing problems, um, especially with that peak flow meter. If you're in the red, and sometimes you can be in the red and not feel super bad, but if you're in the red and you're, you start you start using it and you see that you're in the red and you're like, I don't feel awful. Asthma can go from zero to hundred really quickly. And so when you're in the red, that's, I really, you really do need to consult a physician. You need to go somewhere. You can go to urgent care patients first. You can bring your flow meter and your asthma action plan and say, I'm in the red. I don't feel awful, but I know that that's not good. And then they can still get hold of it, get a cut, hopefully get ahead of a, a flare up that could be happening. Um, the best offense is a good defense. So whenever you're taking care of asthma, because it's so complicated, you have to be an active player in your healthcare team. You have to know your physicians. You have to know your medication regimen and the types of medications. Um, all too often I have patients that come in and, and I, I ask them, I say, what inhalers do you take? And they're like, well, I don't know. I take the red one. And we have a lot of red medication, knowing the difference between the, your rescue medication and your maintenance medication, um, knowing what triggers you, knowing your body, knowing that, okay, well, I can go up a flight of stairs yesterday with no problem. And today I'm having some problems, like pay attention to the, the, what your body's telling you. Also live a healthy lifestyle. Do not smoke cigarettes, um, eat healthy foods that promote good overall well-being, exercise if you can exercise, keep moving. Um, and then you can also research community research, uh, resources. Um, some counties, I don't necessarily think Leon County does it, but some counties in Florida and other states do home checks. Um, you can do smoking cessation and you can also find some asthma support groups. Um, a lot of people tend to ask me, well, when do I need to see a specialist? Like, when do I need to see a pulmonologist or an allergist? Um, there are a couple of, you know, different things that you can consider whenever you want 
whether or not your asthma is well controlled. Um, primary care physicians do and sometimes can manage asthma, but you always want to consider seeing a specialist if you've, you know, if you've had a life-threatening asthma flare that puts you in the hospital, maybe you ended up having to get like a bunch of breathing treatments. Um, if you're not responding to treatment after three to six months, you know, I got put on this type of inhaler and I'm still using my rescue inhaler. I'm still not seeing any results. I still don't feel good. Uh, if you have persistent symptoms that limit your physical activity and daily life, if you're requiring high dose inhaled or oral corticosteroids, if you're taking steroids continuously, um, that means that you probably have a pretty decent type of asthma and it needs to be managed by a specialist. Um, if you need additional testing, like, like I said, those pulmonary function testing, um, chest x-rays, um, allergy testing, uh, uh, allergists here in town are the ones that do the allergy testing. Typically, a primary care is not going to do that at the office. Um, and then if you have other conditions that complicate your asthma, so what we were talking about earlier, if you have dysphagia and a difficulty swallowing, and if that continuously starts triggering your asthma, it might be where you need to see your primary care and go see a specialist, go see maybe a speech therapist so you can get that swallowing taken care of. Um, if you have GERD, GERD can be another one, which is um, uh, esophageal reflux disease, and that can also trigger your asthma. And knowing those triggers, going to see a specialist to get that taken care of, you know, you're, 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 you're going to get a hold of the conditions that are causing your asthma first. Um, there's also a rule of two. If you've used your quick relief inhaler two or more times in one week, if your asthma wakes you up two or more times in a month, and if you're feeling that quick relief inhaler two or more times a year, um, what we like to say in the respiratory community as a respiratory therapist, we, when you come to the hospital, we will prescribe um, scheduled quick relief medications because we want to stay on top of what's happening. However, if you have an albuterol inhaler and you are married to it and you're using it every single day, that to me is a red flag saying that your asthma or your COPD is not well managed, that it's not well controlled, that even despite taking your controlled medications and you're still having breakthroughs, something else happening. So that's whenever you really do need to go see a specialist. We have a bunch of them here. Um, I might be biased, but I love the Tallahassee Pulmonary Clinic. They are affiliated with TMH. Um, we have about anywhere from, I think, 12 to 14 pulmonologists currently at that clinic, and that's just the pulmonologist. We also have nurse practitioners and PAs that see patients. Um, we do have an allergy and asthma diagnostic treatment center. We have the Southeast Asthma and Allergy Center, and then we have the Tallahassee Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. Um, we are recording this, so if for any reason you guys need any of this information, you can always email me and that will be at the end of this presentation. I will be happy to send this information to you, or you can contact Ruth and she'll help you out too. Um, and then education, you know, like I said, it's super important to do, ask questions, do your research. I love, I love questions. Um, we have the Florida Asthma Coalition and TMH is a certified asthma-friendly hospital. Um, we work with Ch Wolfson's Children's Center and uh, in the Florida Asthma Coalition to provide that, that asthma-friendly certification. Um, for some reason, I feel like adults tend to get overlooked, but that's where my position comes in. I'm making sure that my adults with asthma don't get overlooked. And, and so you guys hopefully will start seeing me a little bit sooner. We have the Allergy and Asthma Network, uh, the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, the American Thoracic Society, um, the CDC, and the Guidelines for Diagnosis and Management of Asthma. So um, this is my information right here. It's my office phone number and then my work email. So you guys can call or email me. I would say email for now because currently I am still working bedside because we have had another wave of COVID come through the hospital. So I have not been able to do my chronic lung disease position. Uh, I like to do this on my days off and come at least try and stay in the game and keep some education out there in the community for you guys. And hopefully in the next month or two, if things calm down, I will definitely start seeing patients and doing some more community outreach. Um, and I think that's about it. Do we have any other questions? Uh, people are welcome to unmute themselves with their questions. I, I just want to thank you, Allison, for the role that I know you're playing during this um, uptick in COVID. Uh, I'm sure it's very challenging just to appreciate you and all the other frontline healthcare workers who are caring for these patients. 
Um, I do. Ha I have a lot of questions, um, but let's let our viewers go first in case some of our questions are redundant. Um, I saw the one, the reason for sitting instead of standing. So the reason why I say sit when you're doing your inhalers and you can sit in like an office chair, uh, you know, on the edge. The reason why I say sitting is because especially with the powder inhaler, you're taking that huge, big, deep breath in. And sometimes that can make you dizzy. And I just don't want anybody to do it. You know, if you if you are confident that you're not going to get dizzy from taking a big deep breath, and especially with the powder, I just don't want anybody to pass out. Um, with the MDIs, uh, same kind of same thing. You know, you're not taking as big of a deep breath, but I feel like it's better to kind of coordinate sitting down. Um, I just I get so nervous seeing people stand up doing inhalers. I don't want you to pass out and fall over. I don't want you to get dizzy. I don't want you to. Um, if you're feeling steady on your feet, it's okay to do it standing up, but I just feel like when you're sitting straight up, you can focus on the things that really matter, which is the mechanics of, you know, making sure that you're timing that, that squeeze and then deep breath in or using the arrow chamber. Um, I saw the question about the arrow chamber. I did the, the, the demonstration. Uh, if anybody wants me to go over that again, I can go over that again. I think. I don't think so. Any other questions for anybody? Well, are we, I hopefully we're seeing um, a decline in um, vaping, but are, is there, were you seeing a, a connection between vaping and an increase in asthma? Um, I would say so. I feel like, I think vaping right now is very much a young person problem. Um, I feel like the, a lot of the literature out there is, you know, I, a lot of times I have my COPD patients are like, well, I quit smoking, but I vape now. And that's how I quit smoking. And I feel like vaping is actually going to cause an increase in more COPD patients and more of like a chronic obstructive disease as, as opposed to asthma, only because the damage that it does to the lung tissue is pretty awful. Um, I'll, a lot of times I hear patients say, you know, oh, I heard it was better than smoking. It's absolutely not. It actually speeds up faster than smoking does. Um, if you read back into the literature, I actually have a, an article hanging up in my office back in, back in the day. Um, they used to tell you that smoking cigarettes cured, cured your asthma. That is not the case. And so a lot of times when people sit there and say, well, vaping is better for you than smoking, it's not. It actually speeds up the, the deterioration of your lung tissue. So um, I try my best to give information about vaping. Um, I feel like it's really geared towards kids. I see a lot of college kids and a lot of high school kids vaping these days. And I'm like, why? Please stop. <laughs> um, I just saw where can we get the blank asthma journals and plans. Um, that might be, I mean, I hate to say it, but I feel like Amazon, you can find some of that stuff. You can always make one too. I mean, I, I've pulled that image off of Google as far as the, the action plan. Um, in, if you ever go to get that arrow chamber or not the arrow chamber, the peak flow meter, the peak flow meter has its instructions for use, but it also has, it's very, very tiny, your own little basically journal that comes with it where you can continuously monitor um, your symptoms and stuff. It, it really kind of depends on you. I, I feel like if you really wanted something really specific, um, I'd have to do some research, but even Etsy, there's so many like cool shops and stuff out there. You could probably find an Etsy person who makes journals and say, hey, I have really bad asthma. Can you make me a cute little diary? And I bet you money they would. Um, you can probably just print them for free if you just yeah. search like, you know, asthma journal images, you can exactly tens of thousands and you can just exactly there because there's so many different types out there too. You're going to find one that's very generic, you're going to find one that's very detailed. Um, you know, I would just, I would hit old Google up and then Amazon see what Amazon's got for you too. Mm -hmm. If, if I email you, can you send me a picture of the, all the different inhalers? I wanted to see if I could find mine on there. It wasn't up long enough. But, sure. Uh, I, I mean, I can try and go back to the screen share and pull it back up if you'd like. Okay. Here, let me that was a great slide. But it, and Maureen's right. It was very detailed and hard to see on the screen. Yeah. And I had to run it into the other room and get my inhalers and it was gone. By the time. <laughs> okay. Let me find it for you. Hold on just a second. I'll go back. 
That's one of my favorite ones because when I go see patients, I'm like, I'm like, hey, what do you guys take? And they're like, I don't know, the blue one. And I'm like, oh, well, we have like four blue ones. <laughs> so I always no, I take one that's really expensive and I was going to try and see if I could find a comparable one that I could ask for. Do you that's know the name of it? QVAR. QVAR. Got I it. can't see it on there. <laughs> Trying to find it too. QVAR. I, I don't see a lot of people on QVAR. Um, but yes, I have also heard that it is very expensive. Yeah, and that's the one they give me for maintenance. And mm -hmm. I, I just think there's got to be something else that's that's cheaper that would be comparable. Let me see. Let me see. A lot of times I, I have to, I, you know, I actually have to look at stuff myself. Um, hmm. What is QVAR? Is it a combination? It is a combination. It uh, looks like it is a um, steroid. I believe it's, well, maybe it's a steroid. Like I said, some of the stuff I am still a little iffy about, especially when it comes to asthma, because we don't deliver QVAR at the hospital. So it's not something that I've ever read really. Oh, it's, I found it. It's right over here. There you are, QVAR. Oh, there it is. Okay. It's an inhaled corticosteroid. Um, so it's not a combination. It's actually just a straight up steroid. So sometimes, um, one of the more, one of the more, um, financially, um, easier ones would be like Pomacort, but again, it kind of just depends on what your physician thinks is best for you, but it, it definitely wouldn't hurt to say, Hey, listen, QVAR is really expensive. Is there another, you know, inhaled steroid that I can take, you know, Flovin's actually really popular too. I see a lot of um, a lot of people prescribe the Flovin, the HFA right there. Um, but QVAR is just a basic steroid. And if you want, Pomacort is actually something called budesonide and they do have generics of budesonide and stuff as well. Okay. Is there any research on taking these steroids every day? Does that contribute to like osteoporosis and things like that? Does taking uh, that, inhaled steroids contribute to that? Yes. Um, some of our pulmonologists, uh, I know a couple of them that um, what we do is we look at, and it's kind of similar to COPD. We look at your history of flare-ups and they will try and titrate your dosage. Um, if you have a history of hypersensitivity and you know, you're easily flared up, then they will keep you on a, a, an inhaled corticosteroid regimen because that is the standard of taking care, uh, taking those medicines. It's kind of a, you know, risk versus benefit. If you do have a very hypersensitive airway, um, you know, we wanna keep your asthma well controlled and it can contribute to osteoporosis and you know, some of the steroid side effects. Um, how much compared to oral steroids is probably, it's probably a lot less compared to oral steroids. Um, but if you haven't had a history of any flare ups recently, it's a good question to ask your doctor and say, listen, I haven't had an as, you know, I haven't used my rescue inhaler and I haven't had a flare up in a long time. Do you think that this is going to cause this? Do you think that I could go without it? Or do you think that you know, maybe I can take it during the time of year where my asthma really flares up. And like I said, this is whenever you get to know your asthma. Like if you have a seasonal asthma, like my mom, my mom has COPD, but she's also very sensitive during the summer when it's really hot. So during the summer, when it's really hot, she gets placed on an inhaled corticosteroid just for the summer. And then during the winter, she goes back to her long acting regimen and she goes off the steroid. So it kind of just depends on what your physician thinks is best for you. Okay, thank you. Oh, you're you go, um, Could you go back to the slide while we're back here that was about the in, extrinsic and intrinsic yes. asthma? You covered so much good material. Um, I tried to condense it as yeah. much as I could too, but it just, it gets- it Right there. So with the intrinsic, mm -hmm where it's most commonly caused by respiratory tract infections and viruses. Does that mean it's usually acute versus chronic as well? Yeah, I would say these are, these are more acute. So that's another, another thing that I have kind of noticed with asthma versus COPD is that asthma happens really fast. 
it is a trigger that kind of starts to snowball. And once that snowball starts going, it's kind of really hard to get ahead of it. And that's why it's really important to prevent the flare ups and asthma um, as well. And, and so with COPD, you kind of see, I feel like with COPD, you see your symptoms for a couple of days before it gets really, really bad. Um, with asthma, you'll see your symptoms for like a couple of hour, hours and then it gets really, really bad. Um, the, you know, the adult onset asthma that ends up happening, you just got to kind of figure out your triggers and it's the non-immune mechanisms. You just have some swelling. And like I said, with my mom, it might be a little bit of an overlap for her, but it's that extreme heat that causes it. And then she's more, you know, or whenever it comes to seasonal allergies that causes the upper respiratory viruses and stuff like that. And some people might even use the term, you know, an, an acute bronchitis. Mm -hmm. um, and that has to do with just that hypersensitivity where you, that swelling happens very quickly. Um, and we live in the best place in the world for all of that. We have pollen, we have heat, we have humidity, we have cold. I met a man from Ohio the other day and he was like, oh, it doesn't get very cold here. I was like, actually it does, <laughs> it gets cold. It's just, it lasts for a week. I was like, you gotta dress for the thirties in the morning and the seventies in the afternoon. Be prepared for all seasons in one day. Right, well, this was an interesting slide because my son, especially when he was, now that he's an adult, he's a lot better. But when he was um, growing up, he if he got anything just, you know, a, the slightest cold or cough, it always turned into a major respiratory event with, the, and he'd end up with, you know, respiratory treatments and, and mm -hmm. steroids and mm -hmm. antibiotics, you know, and um, finally, we just kind of learned that if he got like a little sick with anything, he needed to just start all this stuff yep. prophylactically. Yep. But he, but he kind of, it doesn't happen very often to him now. And they, nobody ever said he had asthma. So mm -hmm. I'm thinking that this is what he had was this non-immune intrinsic asthma that and it's it would really, be triggered by a respiratory tract infection. So a lot of thing, a lot of things to consider too is that children you can't you can't formally diagnose um, asthma on a child until they're at least six years old because they cannot perform the diagnostic testing. They can't do the pulmonary function testing. I can't go to a five year old and say, "Can you do this peak flow measurement for me?" Um, so a lot of times. Um, we won't formally diagnose, we'll call it a hypersensitive airway disease. Mm -hmm. And then it is more common in young boys, but then also once puberty hits, a lot of times I've, I, I can't tell you how many times we have children that have really hypersensitive airway, really bad asthma. And once they hit puberty and they go, you know, high school, college, you're like, well, I haven't used my inhaler since I was a little kid. A lot of times, you know, people will say, oh, well, hopefully they'll grow out of it. It is very common, doesn't always happen, but a lot of times whenever children, children that are born with asthma go through puberty, they tend to grow out of it and have um, just, but the opposite can happen. You can have no respiratory problems whatsoever and then turn 50 and all of a sudden have asthma. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's just one of those types of diseases. I, like I said, I've been a therapist for seven and a half years. Asthma still confuses me sometimes because there's so many little different things about it and what causes it. And so, like I said, I like to put in that asthma is more of a syndrome than anything, because it's basically figure out your trigger. Cause when, once you're triggered, the same cascade of symptoms happens, the same cascade of the, you know, the, the inflammatory response, the mucus production, the coughing and wheezing, all of that happens, no matter what you're triggered, it's just what is do what's causing it and what can we do to prevent it? It's just basically the most, most common thing. Does anybody else want me to go to any other slides that they were in love with? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the thermoplasty was interesting and I can you speak a little bit more about how heat could help reduce the inflammation I usually think of so we, like cold reducing inflammation and so yeah he, <laughs> actually, so the the thermoplasty is pretty pretty intense it's one of the more invasive um therapies that they have um whenever we talk about heating it it's when you're we, we can do a couple of different things. We can stent your airways, but that's usually whenever that's, we stent airways where we'll go in with the bronchoscope and actually put a stent to keep the airway stented open. But that has to do with like um, bronchial collapse usually. Mm -hmm. uh, with the 
with the heat, um, what it does is they're essentially kind of burning away that tissue actually mm -hmm. from the inside. Um, so that way there's actually no tissue to get inflamed. Um, it is a pretty extreme therapy um, to be used. Uh, it's not necessarily like a heat therapy, like it will literally kind of take and stent it open and use that therapy to push that away. That way that, that tissue is no longer there. And it, like I said, it's a pretty extreme therapy. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So is that, would that last, is that like for acute treatment or would that, I would say be that would be for, treatment? I would say that that would be for very chronic conditions where, um, where most of the traditional therapies are not working. You've tried biologics, you've tried inhaled medication, you've tried oral medications, no matter what you're doing. Um, I've tried this many things. I feel like, I feel like bron the bronchial thermoplasty, my personal opinion, and I've never, like I said, I've never experienced it. I've assisted in tons of bronchoscopies, but never a thermoplasty. But I would think that that would be kind of a, a last ditch effort to prevent, a, you know, severe flare ups whenever your body's just not responding to any other therapy. Got it. Any other questions? This has been a great conversation, Allison. Um, I'll probably, people will probably ask me if they, if I can email them the slides. Will of course. those be available? If yeah, I can ask. actually, I'll email you the, um, the presentation so you can have it too. Okay, and if everyone wants, I can just send it out to everybody who got the Zoom link. Of course, and then um, if you guys ever think of anything respiratory related, I'm pretty sure I'll email you. I can talk about, like I said, breathing things for days. It's, it's my life. I love it. <laughs> well, so, let me know if there's another topic that you would like to do a presentation on down the sure. road because you've done an excellent job with both of these and we're very, very appreciative. Allison. Of course. I, I, like I said, I love it. I, I want to get out in the community more and the more you guys know, the better that you can handle these, these types of conditions. I feel like they get overlooked so easily. And, and so it, the more you know about it, the more you can prevent flare-ups from happening. You can just live a more comfortable life. Everybody lives a comfortable life when you can breathe well. So, so true. Well, thank you. And it, unless anybody has any more questions, I'm going to go ahead and end this meeting. Thank you all for being oh, here. Thank, and you, thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. All right, everybody thank you. breathe well. Right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>